Okay, other uh, mandatory requirements with regards to systems. Um, we have controls, we have ducts, we have mechanical system piping insulation, circulating hot water systems, uh, their insulation as well as mechanical ventilation and equipment sizing. Uh, and there's also some switching requirements with regards to some of these as well. Uh, so, um, we also want to think about systems that govern multifamily dwelling units as well as snow melt systems and pools. All right, let's talk about thermostats and controls. Uh, first of all, uh, at least one thermostat for each separate heating and cooling system. That's required. And this thermostat needs to be programmable and is required when forced air is the primary heating system. There is a code requirement with regards to heat pumps. Now, heat pumps are basically air conditioners that run in reverse. And uh, so they basically take heat out of the outdoor air and they take that heat and they essentially pump it to the inside. But as the outdoor temperature starts getting down below the 30s, these systems efficiency drop off quite a bit. And um, in many cases, if it gets much colder than that, the heat pump itself could not keep up with the heating demand of the house. Some manufacturers' models are still efficient down to about 5 degrees Fahrenheit, though. So it's important to check the individual model. So typically these heat pumps have what they call supplementary heat. And there are two basic forms of that. One is uh, it could have a natural gas or, or fossil fuel filed, uh, fi uh, fired furnace. Or most of the time they'll have an electric furnace backup. Now these electric uh, furnaces have basically electric elements or what they call heat strips. And these things can generate, they're like a giant toaster, but they can basically um, be as much as 10 kW of electricity usage. So when these electric strips heat up, they do meet the demand for heating the house, but it's not a very efficient way to do it. It's very expensive. So the code requires that heat pumps have these controls so that if the heat pump can, in fact, keep up with the heating demand of the house, that these strips won't kick on until absolutely necessary. So that's what that refers to when we're talking about supplementary heat controls. An important mandatory requirement of the code is that ducts have to be sealed. That means all ducts, air handlers, uh, plenums, uh, filter boxes, uh, they all have to be sealed and uh, tested. Um, and they're tested with what we call a duct blast test. Uh, this is where we actually use a fan to quantify how leaky the ducts are. We'll talk more a little bit about that later. The, the only exception to the testing requirement is if all the ducts and equipment are located completely in conditioned spaces. Supplies, returns, all of them have to be located in the conditioned space. Otherwise, you have to perform this duct blast test. Okay, so let's talk about ducts. Um, it's easy to make a lot of mistakes in duct work that truly affects the performance of a system. Uh, one of the most important things in an HVAC system is to have adequate airflow. You can't heat or cool air unless you're moving it across a coil or a heat exchanger. And the degree at which you can do that is a function of your distribution system, which is the ducts. So here, for example, if we look at the picture on our left, we can see that we have a support uh, strap that is almost pinching off the duct. When we look at the way uh, this duct is folded around one of the structural members here in the center photo, you know, you can imagine how little air is going to flow through that. So if you don't have adequate airflow, you're not going to get substantial amount of heating or cooling to make the occupants comfortable. Now, some other tips with regards to duct insulation. We want to make sure that we don't have uh, two, uh, our supports too far apart. So, for example, the maximum is 10 feet by code. Uh, ideally, you would want that to be even less than that because we don't want ducts and so forth to sag. My personal recommendation is less than four feet. Uh, we want to avoid tight bends. We want to minimize sagging. We want to size the ducts appropriately. Oftentimes in HVAC systems, the ducts themselves uh, are undersized while the system equipment is oversized. And so we use the Air Conditioning Contractors Association of America, their Manual D, to design uh, the size of the ducts. So we want to make sure they're sized properly. And of course, if we can place these ducts inside the building envelope, that's always the best practice. Okay? So we want to make sure they're sealed. If they're metal ducts, we use mastics. Uh, if they're flex duct, we certainly want to make sure that we use the appropriate duct tapes. So if we, if, and if we have uh, lots of duct leaks, that can result in pressure differences that cause moisture to flow in and out of the structure. Here's a good example of a lot of moisture damage caused from an HVAC system that had a lot of leakage, which created pressure differences, which causes warm, moist air to come in contact with cold surfaces. Now, there are all kinds of different duct work that we can use within the code. There's rigid metal duct, there's rigid uh, fiberglass duct work, there's flex duct, a lot of different products. The code is sort of agnostic to these types of uh, uh, materials that are used, but it is important that these systems are 
installed in such a way that are compliant with the code. So let's take a look at this picture on the left here. We can see that we have a hole in, in the floor and that stud cavity is either a supply or a return air duct. Under the code, you, could not use, you cannot use building cavities as a supply duct. Another important mistake that's being made here is that we have a wire that runs through the duct cavity. That's totally not appropriate. Then you'll notice the middle picture. We can see that there's just a draw band uh, and some duct tape around a, uh, a, a boot to, to flex that connection. That's not adequate. It needs to be have the appropriate tape and it needs to be appropriately sealed. And then finally we see uh, at the lower picture here, we see a return air duct that has no sealant. The, any return air ducts where we use building cavities as a return air duct, by the way, which is not a good practice, uh, but nevertheless, the code does allow return air duct work to be in building cavities, but that has to be sealed. Um, leaky ducts uh, here, as we can see here, the insulation is kind of falling off of them. There's uh, the transition between this uh, plenum and the uh, collar which mounts to the flex duct. You can see all the holes around that, so that's going to leak. That would not pass code. Again, all the duct work has to be sealed. So uh, not a bad idea, too, uh, to make sure that the, 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 for the builders to understand that they, need to, they can design the home in such a way that it's easier for the HVAC contractors to run their duct work. Oftentimes what I see in the field is that um, the architect never works with the HVAC contractor to figure out where they're going to put the ducts. So in the process in the field, uh, the, the people installing the ductwork systems, they have to do all sorts of contortions and things that compress the ductwork and create all kinds of bends and restrictions that really prevent the ductwork from working properly just because people didn't put their heads together and come up with a good plan to begin with. Um, so, again, ducts inside conditioned space, a good example of that here is where we have a, a, a soffit that's built so that you can keep the ductwork in conditioned space. Again, that's always the best practice. You also notice a transfer grill is used so that uh, we have good airflow between, uh, you know, separated rooms. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So, uh, the, with regards to section 403.2, seal all cavities, air handlers, filter boxes, building cavities that are used as ducts. We want to seal and securely fasten all joints, traverse seams, connections with either wells, uh, gaskets, uh, mastic sealants, uh, mastic plus embedded fabric systems. That's where we have gaps that are too big uh, for the mastic to fill without, you know, eventually falling off. Uh, and the appropriate tapes. Unlisted duct tape is not permitted as a sealant on any metal ducts. So in other words, the duct tape must be UL 181A or B listed per the IRC. Also, to say this again, and I know I've said it many times, is that no building cavities can be used for supply ducts. The reason for that is, is if we pressurize that duct space with warm or cooled air, that eventually communicates with the outdoors. It's almost impossible to get those building cavities airtight. And so for this version of the code, of course, you can't use building cavities for supply ducts. You can't for return air ducts even though that's not a very good practice. So it's always worthwhile to encourage that builders not use any building cavities for supply or return air ducts. Okay, so let's talk about how the uh, uh, ducts are to be tested or evaluated with a duct blaster. There's a post-construction test, and that means that uh, when the system is completely done, the drywall's up, we come in and do a duct blast test, and the maximum leakage there to the outside can be no more than eight cubic feet of air per minute per hundred square feet of floor area. Now, the maximum total leakage, um, you know, that's the inside or outside, can be no more than 12 cubic feet of air per minute per hundred square feet of floor area. Now, see, some of the leakage happens to the inside, some of it happens to the outside. Obviously, what happens to the outside is a bad thing because we're paying the heat and cool all the outdoors. The okay, second approach is to do what we call a rough-in test. And this can be done before the air handler is installed or even before the drywall is installed. So if the, one of the rough-in tests, for example, you can have a maximum of no more than 6 CFM per 100 square feet of floor area. And the maximum uh, total leakage uh, without the air handler is only 4 cubic feet of air per minute per 100 square feet of floor area. Now that sounds like less, but it's not really. It's actually a more stringent test because they know that when we put the rest of the system together, you're even going to have more leakage. So uh, it's actually a more uh, stringent test for that reason. So an example of what this means uh, for a typical 2,000 square foot house uh, we can't have more leakage to the outside than 160 cubic feet of air per minute. And the maximum total leakage is 
240 cubic feet of air per minute, uh, and that is for a typical 2,000 square foot house. It's a pretty lenient number. It's not that hard to get there, but it's certainly better than uh, the typical four, you know, three to 400 CFM that we see in, in a lot of homes. And this is what a duct blaster looks like here. They're doing a rough end test. You can see there's no air handler installed. There's no drywall installed. They're just simply testing the supply and return air duct in the system without the air handler. 